Norman, just walk us through your early days in education. I started uh, teaching in Scotland, in Dunbar, and I was there for a fairly short time, a year or two. Then I came to Isha and took over the school in the late, 40, early 50s, in fact. And I've been here ever since. <laughs> There's uh, something approaching 41 years, isn't it? I suppose it's getting on that way. Uh, every now and again I count them, but I don't have anything like golden things and all that sort of stuff. Some schools do. It's been called the most academic school in the south of England, in fact, in the country. Would you actually say there's any element of uh, truth to that? It's maybe? a little difficult to describe academic or academic. I mean, it's a school of so many different varieties of, of work and such and so on that um, I would say it is a very academic school, but we do, on the subject of academic, we don't have just very bright pupils, but there aren't any stupid people here. So the standard is obviously very high, and we do achieve actually more what, prestigious scholarships, I think, per boy and girl than probably any school in England. But while it's true to say that you've topped the, uh, the league table over the course of the last 15 years, the fact is it's actually a much more balanced school than the perception uh, that exists um, outside. The fact is that there, I understand there, there's sports goes on every single day in the, in the curriculum. I think it's very rare in a school to have games every day. The whole school goes out about quarter to three in the afternoon, comes back at four o'clock, come rain, come shine. And that goes on, and then after that, no doubt, they have work, and of course before it. But it's broken up, so that we do have a mix, and I think that is one of the great features of the school. You are a very tough individual. People have accused you of being really quite autocratic, difficult to get along with, impossible although sometimes, and yet you're an extremely sensitive and passionate man. Who's the true Norman Hale? Impossible question to answer, but a mixture, I suppose, of both. When you talk about getting on with, I mean, is it getting on with parents? Is it getting on with the rest of the staff? Is it getting on with the boys? I don't think I am particularly easy man to work for, if I've got the grammar of that right. And I am, I do tend to be autocratic, though I know what is right and the other people don't. And I think that is certainly a failing on my part. Um, with parents, I do flatter myself that I get on pretty well with them. Very rarely have any complications when I meet them. There's certainly no sycophancy, there's no question of um, making things out that aren't. They just see the lot, they come and see the school, and very frequently, most frequently, when available, I get children to take them around and they can ask any sort of question they like, awkward ones or does. So it's all absolutely open. Just as, of course, the work is, because this is unusual in schools, that um, the boys and girls can take their work home at any time and the parents can see it at any time and the parents can come to see me or the staff at any time, which I think is possibly unique. You don't have to wait for one of these open days and that kind of thing. Get on the blower to me and I fix it up and the person concerned, the father or mother or both, can come and see the staff and or myself. What do you think are the core values that have made this school what it is today? Tremendous enthusiasm on the part, of course, of the staff, which is quite outstanding continuity of office. I'm not talking about necessarily the headmaster, but the others. It is um, this year, for instance, one master is going and he's been here nine years and most people have been here double that, which is of course an enormous help to the children because they give them that wonderful thing called confidence, which I think is a very important part of the, the school, its attitude. But you actually believe in continuity. I mean, the, um, you actually quite clearly believe in making investment in, in the staffing here because 
at the end of the day, it could well be argued that the facilities have come a bit up on the short side. Oh, very much so. We've never gone in very much for, for facilities, but um, we've gone in for the spirit of the thing. Um, perhaps it's just worth mentioning that uh, we have hundreds of acres which we don't own. It's common land which we use, and boys go out running and um, having ambushes and nonsenses like that every day, as I said. There is no gymnasium, and yet we win medals for that sort of thing, <laughs> quite incredibly. And um, it is an out-of-door school, insofar as one can, but we're extremely lucky, of course, in the environment. Do you think, I mean, you actually pride yourself on not being necessarily in sync with the times. You don't consider this to be a terribly um, politically correct school. It's actually really quite <laughs> idiosyncratic. It is politically incorrect, I should say. In the whole. Perhaps I sometimes could be accused of rather pushing it and flaunting it a little. But um, I think I rather, it, didn't, I, it amuses me that, just as the children amuse me. And I ask a class very often because I teach uh, at least half time myself. I ask them to say, I ask them to tell me, um, to amuse me, to tell me stories. And I enjoy their stories and that kind of thing. And I'm always taken, carried away hopelessly by red herrings. But you still teach, don't you? Very much so, which I think is rather nice. And I teach late in the afternoon too. So quite often I'm in school till quarter past six or half past six in my last class. And for instance, Saturday mornings. I mean, is it part of the credo of the school that you actually try and do as much of the schooling within school hours and don't actually um, uh, inflict too much prep on the kids thereafter? I'm not a believer in long preps at night because it's a long day here and I am a believer in short, sharp lessons and preps. For instance, I, um, by way of telling people that five or ten minutes intensive work is far better than mooning over books for hours on end. So I suppose the preps would vary from quite short ones from 20 minutes or so in the baby forms to up to three quarters of an hour and obviously more at the top of the school, but never ever. And I would like to mention the remark of the headmaster of Harrow. He said that um, this particular school, we should have expected the boys coming to Harrow to be overcooked, the children. But he said they were not and they go on to do great things. That sounds a bit like boasting, but it's a fact that's what we do. And they do not get stale. I think I can happily say that. So really what you're saying is that the kids here, both boys and girls, are stretched rather than crammed. I am saying that, yes, absolutely. But when were girls introduced to the school? Ah, about 20 years ago, in a rather haphazard and typically Melbourne way of doing it. I was actually dining out with some friends when the lady of the house, a very strong personality, shoved me down into an armchair, cigar and a brandy, etc. And he said, why do you not take girls in the school? I said, we never have. Don't intend to do so in future, in a rather stupid way. And um, then she said, well, you're going to take my daughter. I said, I'm most certainly not. And so we bantered like this for some time. And then eventually I said, well, all right then, we'll do it. And she was number one. She's married and got children. She's a doctor, I think. What do you think girls bring into this? Well, I think they bring in a sense of, um, a sense of balance in the school. They certainly perform possibly because only the best school guest girls want to come to the school. So it's rather difficult all those other people don't. And many people think it isn't the right sort of thing to do, to have just some girls, not others. But they do do so very well in games and in their work. And they are quite outstanding. Well, another part of the idiosyncratic nature of the school is that yeah. the girls actually here participate in all sports, including rugby. Oh, absolutely, yes. I saw one get a try the oh, year before last. It was quite, quite dramatic. And a good tackler she was, too. She's gone on to other things now. <laughs> <laughs> is it a problem that uh, you'll get some girls leaving at 11 because that's the way the girls go, well, and, and others at 13? Marvellously, very rarely, just as in the old days when there was a, the 11 plus, boys would always stay on to 13. That is part of, a, of the package, as it were. Though, of course, people aren't uh, obliged to 
um, right hand thing on the line and say, I'm going to keep my son or daughter heddled. But in 99 cases out of 100, they settle 13, including the girls. Though, as you quite right to say, 11 is the age of movement from one school to another than the girls, the girls. And I think it's a great pity. But both boys and girls are prepped, but interestingly, things are, are, are prepped. Yes. When, and, I mean, this school leaves, lives up to your expectations. Of the city. It, it, mm. Its motto is to exceed expectations, not yes. only of the pupils and their parents, but even the teachers in some, yeah. in some cases. When you talk about a preparatory school, that's precisely what this school is. But you actually prepare the kids far more for boarding school than day school. Why is that? I like the idea of a boarding school. I've, I think at the age of eight it is very young because, of course, there's still <coughs> a number of boarding schools taking children of that age. I think 13 is about the right sort of age to go away if you are going away. And I have found that they do prosper and they have to stand on their own feet. And having been through this sort of curriculum at Melbourne Lodge, they're able to do so with that confidence that I'd mentioned before, which is perhaps one of the most important things we try to instill. It has been argued that there is a perceived gulf between the A and the B stream kids here. Would you actually subscribe to that view? No, I would not subscribe to it at all. And I give a very good example. This particular year, in fact, only a few weeks ago, two boys got scholarships, admitted minor scholarships, to Wellington College, who were actually in the B stream. And so I think that gives a lie to that. Well, you could say, I suppose, that the, the B stream was good and the A stream was very, very good. Your view is the B stream is a match to any, any other school's A stream? Absolutely. In some cases, I have to be careful what I say, but in some cases it could even be that. <clears throat> The, uh, I mean, uh, these common entrance results from this year have just come out. Speak for themselves. And um, they're very strong, where boys, the average uh, boys' results in the B stream were something approximating seven or eight A's. Yes, in, that in sort of thing. Mm. That's a very strong result. Yes. Always bearing in mind, I must say, that um, we sent to schools which aren't <laughs> rather below, I rather have to be careful what I say, but they're not. Well, the weaker schools, they're very powerful schools, demanding very high standards. Because although the papers are the same and the common entrance, they're marked by the school where the boy is going, the boy or girl is going, and they mark very differently. You have quite an interesting relationship with key schools like Eton, Winchester, Charterhouse, Wellington, and so, and so on. But you only really discovered Eton, didn't you, about 25 years ago, even though you've been yes. trading as a, tr as a school for 40 years plus. Why, is, why the sudden conviction? Yes. We did send, I don't know how many, sort of about 20 years ago, most of our best scholars to Winchester. And it was only a chance meeting on an occasion when I met um, the headmaster and the master scholars at Eton. And he said, why on earth aren't you sending boys here? And I said, hadn't really thought about that or words that effect. Anyhow, I'd started from that. And now I'd say it's co-equal. We send as many to one as the other. And each has their own. I don't want to talk too much about that. Each has their own merit. I mean, the schools. I mean, are you quite clear that by the time the boys and girls are, say, 10 or 11, mm -hmm. um, during their sojourn here at Milburn, you're quite clear about what type of school is best suited to their merits? I think that is so. I would say that. I mean, the last ever... two years, of course, are very important, and they do change. And so quite often I suggest an alternative. Is this one of the reasons why you're so against the day schools where they have this um, admission test at the ages of 10 or 11 where yes. lots of the children have simply not re reached the peak of their abilities? Absolutely. Here we flourish after 11. And we actually will have done by 11, two or three years of French and Latin. So we gain nothing of 
that way at all. I mean, we gain enormously, but it is easier for other people who are taking, as it were, the 11 plus to score. And so that's another reason why I do discourage the day schools around here. Plus the fact that there's a great pressure on them, and I don't like that. Contrary to what many people think, we don't have that here. Let's go back onto other things that you don't have here. Um, one of which is uh, the likes of computers. Oh, yes. uh, why is that? Why do you feel so strongly? Yes, I was afraid you were going to ask me about um, computers. And it's rather difficult to be, I excuse the pun, to marshal the <laughs> an argument against it. I think that I'm against it because, particularly in the computer games, which I do deplore, because children are not reading as much, and it may be just a voice crying in the wilderness, whatever the expression is, but it's um, very hard indeed to keep them at it and to read. And I do find it mostly a waste of time. But I must say um, that we do have computers in the school, but we don't actually learn them. And we have actually discussed this with the heads of mathematics of the major public schools, and they're very much on our side. You don't have any governors at the school who simply don't believe that they are necessary or requirement, and yet there is um, a sort of uh, parents' association. Um, do you think that has any value? I think it's got value for getting people together socially, but as for governing, absolutely out. Um, one of the successes of the school has been that we haven't been governed, we've governed ourselves. And it seems to be very much more. I think on the whole, you see, as I was um, um, very much the core of the situation is that if you have governors and an incident occurs at the school, it may take some weeks before it could be solved. It might be something like a case of bullying or that sort of thing. And by the time you've got governors together, I mean, the business is either forgotten or it's, you know, it's gone into, just gone off. Is that also a function, the fact that a board of governors does not exist because the, the fact remains that the school is small enough to be able to get the right sort of feedback all the time? I mean, you've kept it, the number's deliberately low. You could grow bigger. Easily. We could build buildings and that kind of thing, but we're very happy in how things are at the moment. And... Um, once you get governors, MLP doesn't come into talk because you mentioned that, because that is very minor fundraising and it goes to children, as you know, for coach trips and that kind of thing. And may I say that there's never been an appeal, and there never will be one, because I think it's a great, an awful waste of time, and I think it's rather obnoxious to parents if they're paying fees for education. But your fees are not terribly high in real terms. I think they're one of the lowest around. <laughs> I'm not advertising it, it is in fact. But would you say that not having governors is as much the fact that you want to retain control as much as anything else? Yes, I, do. I suppose one ought to look at oneself more in this way. The Greeks had a phrase, Nathis Yotan, know thyself. And I don't think I know myself well enough. I mean, I'm not being stupid about it, silly. I think one perhaps could examine oneself on that. The power and the glory, you mean. Yes, there's a bit of that, I suppose. But it seems... Although it sounds selfish and um, pushing oneself into the front, it seems to work in school. It seems to work, I think, because it's motivated, obviously, by me, the whole thing, and everyone else seems to rather enjoy this way of doing it. Do Otherwise, they wouldn't stay, presumably. Do you think it's more a reflection of the pure passion that you've still held on to after all these years. Yes, I think, yes, possibly it's that. Well, I mean, we there know... There is a passion, yes. Well, we know, passion. for example, that in spite of the ac academic um, results which mm. speak for themselves, the fact is that you still tip up to every first 15 rugby game, to every mm. first 11 football game, first 11 cricket, and so on. You're always there um, supporting the troops. Always. Um, perhaps once or twice in 20 or 30 years I've missed. And I put parents lower than children. I put that rather clumsily, but I think the children are the most important things. And um, very nice, of course, parents come along and discuss things, but the children are the most important things. That's why I always find time for seeing them and take an interest in them. 
Let's just go back to the teaching for a second, because the one thing that is becoming quite clear is the, we've talked about the quality of teaching, we know that as a fact, but the, what is different perhaps about this school is that you, the teachers seem to talk to the children as adults and not as children. Would you say there's any basis to treating that? Absolutely true, completely so. Treated as grown-up people and not pumping facts into them but discussions. Do you believe that the sort of stewardship that the school takes responsibility for is effectively a match to what perhaps uh, secondary schools, boarding schools, take on five years down the line? Yes, I think we do do that. I think we give them a feeling of, um, of confidence, I keep coming back to that, of confidence, and also a feeling that they're going to achieve. They're going to do better than other people. Over-competitiveness, of course, one abhors. But you get peer group pressure here, not just in terms of the academic work, but actually also on the, on the sports field. I mean, mm. in, in, in spite of the perception of the school, which we've said, which is basically an outside one, mm. the, the fact remains the school performs extraordinarily well on the sports field. Uh, in almost every in almost every as aspect, you know, they go they out into the woods and yeah. uh, do their cross country runs, yeah, but, they actually, that, yeah. but they actually win all the cups. Yeah, that's uh, true. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. That are as a regional, even national, in, in some respects. That is actually true. Yes. yes. But if there's one thing, one feature about the kids that's important to you, what would it be? that they seem to enjoy all they do. They do it with enormous zest. It's been likened some years ago, a metaphor was used, like bees around a honeypot. They're buzzing the whole time. And I think that's the impression that people get when they come to see the school. You can't hold them back. They're very noisy, very boisterous. But when they get into the classroom, they get down to it. And that seems to be my ideal, <laughs> simply so. The enthusiasm is tremendous. You've done a good job, Norman. Well done. Thank you. <laughs>